Startup Hour in association with Power FM. Today on the Startup Hour, we discuss Zambia's lucrative real estate market with uh, Christopher Janou, who's a serial entrepreneur, uh, managing director of Janou Afrique, and chairman of Janou Group. Christopher Janou is an award winning producer, author, hotelier, and investor. His group has invested in a range of uh, development sectors, including media, hospitality, fine tech, uh, low-cost housing, and commercial property development throughout Africa. In 2005, he sold or assigned his media interest to lead a group of international investors intent on building global businesses in the frontier markets of Africa. Today, they include Urban Hotel Group, a Pan-African rollout of a value chain of business hotels and self-catered apartments, Janou Afrique, a developer of real estate, real uh, retail malls and commercial real estate and business intelligence, a corporate education and advisory company. The parent group also sponsors the Zambia International Property Expo and Protec Africa. Yearly events facilitated uh, with generous support from uh, UNCTAD, uh, the, IW, uh, the ILO Green Jobs Program and the Embassy of Finland. Manhattan-born Janu began his unlikely career as a record producer during the early 90s. He was signed to MCA Records and enjoyed a series of top 10 singles while producing and remixing for an array of artists including the likes of CSC, Music Factory, D'Angelo, Maxwell and Madonna. Throughout the 1990s, Jano built and sold numerous media properties, including two broadcast production companies, a record label, and a publishing arm. In 1997, the success of his record label of his record company, in Notorious New York, was the subject of a feature on a CNN Entertainment segment. Segment in 2002, Broads Magazine named him as one of the industry's most influential producers. Jano's first book, titled "The Internationalist: Globalization, the Age of Information." and the developing world ascent available on amazon.com is a sweeping look at the next surge of human and economic development as technology globalization and demographics become defining forces he regularly speaks at universities conferences on themes related to technology and the new economy topics covered extensively in his books Janou and his young family reside between New York City and Africa. He's also current president of uh, the American Chamber of Commerce, Zambia. As per tradition, we have a quote for our guests and our listeners to kick off the show. It goes as follows. Well done is better than well said. Talk less, do more. By Ben Franklin. Christopher Genou, good morning. Welcome to the Startup Hour. Thank you, Patrick. That, that was a very nice introduction. Appreciate it. Thank you. First things first, uh, since we're talking real estate, and indeed we're talking uh, the Zambian real estate market, sure. describe it in, uh, in your own perspective. How would you describe uh, Zambia's real estate market? You know, it's funny because a, a lot of times people overgeneralize about, about any industry. You know, they'll, they'll say things like, you know, that it's, it's overtraded in retail because we've got all these new malls or... It's, uh, it's too difficult to, to get mortgage financing because the banks are a little tight right now. And uh, as I was telling Mwape uh, outside, you know, the, the, the brilliant thing about real estate is it's, it, it, the fact that it's in an inefficient market is, is what makes it so opportunistic. And, uh, you know, I'm from New York City. I really had a great life there. Um, the reason we came to Africa was simply because... The, uh, the growth in demographics uh, told us that this was going to be one of the unique opportunities, one, one of the unique window of opportunities in, uh, in real estate development of all kinds. And that's all driven by certain fundamentals. I mean, you've got this, you know, uh, rapid urbanization happening in the next uh, 15 years, 70% of Africans will live in the cities. Um, you've got all this infrastructure development that's needed, you know, that's why in most uh, growing African cities, the, the, the roads are clogged. You know, Tabo Mbeki is a mess during certain parts of the, of the day. Um, and that's because the, the growth is, uh, the infrastructure growth is not keeping up with the, the actual needs and the, and the real estate growth. So that's inconvenient for sure. But uh, real estate investors see that as an opportunity. When I see a lot of people trying to concentrate in a small area, and I see the city uh, boundaries exploding outward uh, at such a rapid clip, that is uh, an investor's dream. You know, that, that tells you, okay, this is, this is a place where, where uh, they're going to need a lot more housing, they're going to need a lot more retail, they need more infrastructure. Uh, when they get the infrastructure, there'll be more houses. When there are more houses, they'll need more schools, they'll need more services. Uh, and, 
you know, growth is what investors look for, and, and Africa just looked like a really unique opportunity. And so we, we you know, sort of voted with our feet and landed here. <laughs> Uh, just to take you off, 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 off topic for a second, sure. uh, when, when you say you see growth, does that mean uh, maybe all of us should look at some of the, you know, the frustrations that we have with uh, traffic and, 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 uh, and all these as an opportunity, irrespective of what business sector we're in? Well, sh certainly there are opportunities, uh, but I, I, th I think they're more, you know, it's, it's sort of like reading a book. You know, you, you, you have little indicators, you know, when you, when you see... Um, when you see a lot of traffic or you see suddenly, you know, a, 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 you know, McKinney used to be the country and now it's kind of like mainstream. I live in New Kasama and, and suddenly there's like malls around me. Um, you know, I, I tend to look at those things without judging. It just they're, they're indicators. It's sort of like a wind vane, right? And uh, so all the indicators to me look like, you know, there's a lot of opportunities. The key is, though, it's not a one trick pony this is not a, a blanket general generalized story mm -hmm. you know in any uh industry you're gonna you're gonna have good deals and bad deals so the the key is you know do you do you do you see which ones are the good ones do you can you can you find the opportunities do you have an angle mm -hmm. do you know what your niche is do you know what you're good at and uh you know hopefully we'll we'll touch on on some of that stuff today but um uh you know the the real estate game is one of the most democratic ways to make money there is meaning it's available to everybody right you know if you want to get in mining or if you want to get in retail you need certain things you need equipment or you need a retail space or you need inventory you need working capital real estate thing is 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 not like that i mean you you certainly you can use all those things you can you know money makes money right but uh it's one of the industries one of the only industries where you can kind of enter at any level and, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Mm -hmm. How how lucrative do do you see the market right now? You know, we we like uh, I really like the hotel business a lot. So we just opened a hotel in Indola on the Indola Golf Estate called the Urban, mm -hmm. and it's about four or five months old and it's almost stabilized. Um, we want to do a lot more hotels, but but we're quite specific about what we want to do. We don't do four and five star hotels we do three star international class value hotels meaning you know sort of like the stay easy but a little more hip and cool because i come from the music business so mm -hmm, i want it to mm -hmm. be vibey you know mm -hmm. i want i want cute girls at the bar and all that <laughs> stuff so uh you know we do a specific thing and we know we we stick to our knitting you know 100 120 you know 1200 quacha a night um uh, for the long stay apartments it's 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 also a value product this looks super cool it's great value uh, it's something that, that would be competitive in Miami or London. You know, we don't do, you know, uh, real, real bespoke things. We, mm -hmm. we try and do a, a thing and do it well. Mm -hmm. In the retail sector, we're, we're also excited about that. Because funny enough, if you talk to people who, who don't really analyze the market, they'll, they'll say, you know, gosh, all these malls, Manda Hill, Arcades is expanding, Acacia East Park's giant. And you've got the two. You've got the, the one uh, down at Airport Circle and the one across the way from it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's a lot of pressure on on uh, retail. You know, the rents are coming down, and people are you know money's tight. We don't try and do that. We, you know, where are they not building malls, and where do they need them? You know, so we're we're doing uh, retail centers uh, that are uh, in places like Garden Compound or Chinsali or Utenderi or Chawama, places where they're under traded, under serviced, under served, um, and that's where you know, the, the opportunities are. I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of a, a metaphor or, or an anecdote uh, that, that compares to why I came to Africa. Like when I was in New York, I was surrounded by lots of guys who had a lot more money and a lot more buildings and a lot more experience than I did. So let me go someplace where I have a value proposition. Let me go to Africa where I have a point of view that's kind of unique. Um, I do things that they need. I understand hotels. I understand development. I understand some other things. And you know, there are not a lot of people like me trying to do it. So um, the key was just to find a unique selling proposition, try and stand out. And, you know, that applies in your own market. You know, mm -hmm. you, you also want to do that if you're Zambian in Zambia. Mm -hmm. You want to find an angle, like what you're good at, what you know, what you what you own in terms of whether it's a knowledge base. And it could be knowledge about a particular market. Let's say you're from, let's say you're from Ndeki or you're from Kalingalinga or you're mm -hmm. from, you know, Kasama. Uh, you know, it's it's 
if you know that market better than anybody else, you know where the deals are. Because, you know, deals are, uh, you don't go to a broker to find deals. They, they, they come to you in the funniest ways. A rumor, a neighbor, somebody's getting divorced, somebody just passed away, somebody's getting married, somebody's moving away. And this, is, this all creates dynamic that can lead to opportunity. Um, and so it's a very local game, isn't it? You mm -hmm. know? Yeah. I mean, you, you kind of have to have boots on the ground. You have to have your network. And, you know, as your reputation increases, you, you, you suddenly um, find yourself a repository of information. And, you know, Patrick, if you, if you had information on your hometown, where are you from? Mm -hmm. Where are you from? Lusaka. Lusaka. Okay. Mm -hmm. what, what part? Uh, okay. I would flip-flop on that one. I would say Lusaka West. Okay. So you know stuff about Lusaka West I will never know. Right. You know, and if if I trust you and you are getting information that that, that I deem valuable, then we're in relationship, mm -hmm. you know, and that's I count on people like that, you know, to kind of tell me things, you know, so uh, and we all do. That's that's what that's what networking is all about. Amazing. Um, you you've had an interesting career, CJ, from from being a producer to being a hotel, yes, one would think, how does one <laughs> <laughs> switch so many careers and still manage to make it in each one? It's a funny story. I, I'll share it with you if you want to hear it. That's fine. Because, because, you know, my dream was to be in the in the record business. You know, when I I was one of those kids that had posters on my wall, and I wanted to be those guys, right? Uh -huh. That's why my hair is still long, probably. <laughs> and um, uh, I went to college to go be an architect because, and I didn't know what I wanted to do, but the, I took a test and they said, <laughs> CG, you'll make a great architect. You have all those aptitudes. I'm like, okay, I'll go to architecture school. Mm -hmm. And I, I showed up and it was like a forced marriage because I just did not like it. You know, I did it for a year and I saw the guys around me being so serious about it. And I was like, you know, I'm not as serious as these guys. I want to be a rock star. That's what I want to do. <laughs> And some, somewhere around my junior year of college, I, after I was bouncing around for a couple of years, I did film and I did business and I did international affairs and I was interested in a lot of stuff. It just hit me like a silver bullet through the forehead. I was in love with music like I was in love with a girl and nobody was going to tell me not to marry her. And I dropped out of college and I went to New York and I lived in a basement below a fortune cookie factory and I practiced my guitar. And I got nowhere for about five years. Mm. And I thought this could be the worst decision of my life. But like I said, man, you know, when you when you fall in love with a girl, nobody's going to talk you out of it, right? And I was still in love, you know. And I got lucky. I I started dating a girl who she she came home one day uh, and said to me, she goes, "Honey, I was just asked to dance in this band." Oh, which band? I don't know. They're a new band. They're called CNC Music Factory. I was like, what a stupid name. <laughs> Seriously. And I had never seen anything like it. Within, within six months, this band was world famous. And, and my girlfriend was getting calls from like boys to men and stuff. You know, guys trying to ask her out. <laughs> She'd met on the road. And I was like, I have to get famous. <laughs> so uh, long story short, I, I couldn't get a record deal. So I put out my own record and I got really lucky and it went to number three in the world mm -hmm. in, uh, as a dance record. It was called Release Me. It's actually on, on YouTube. Um, it's one of those, mm -ta, mm -ta, mm -ta, mm -ta, mm -ta, you know. Uh, so uh, uh, that got me in the record business. And uh, I, I, I was happily in the record business for about 10 years and, and made, made a good living at it. But something happened. Um, I noticed, like when I got in the record business, you needed a lot of money to own a studio. That was the barrier to entry. You know, it was all about... You know, there were, there were a handful of guys, a handful of producers, a handful of studios, and we owned the keys to the kingdom. You know, nobody else could get in. But with technology uh, exploding like it did, suddenly everybody was making music uh, on, you know, beatboxes and, and MPCs and, and rolling drum machines. And suddenly it was everywhere, and music became a commodity. And I realized very quickly, you know, because I had mortgages to pay and all that stuff because I had a nice ride, uh, that I, I could see that this music was getting disrupted and was the, the music industry was not was basically collapsing beneath my feet. I could feel it and I felt it early enough because I was a business owner. Mm -hmm. But um, and it, it didn't just happen to me. I mean, it was like CEOs of, of big companies like Hollywood Records and stuff were, were suddenly like, you know, representing artists five years later trying to get them gigs and clubs and stuff. Um, you know, this happened to the travel business, this happened to the, the, the publishing business, this happened to the retail business, this, 
this happened to the music business, obviously, the, the film business, the entertainment business. And it went through this big adjustment. And uh, this was like right around 2000, 2002. And I realized, man, I may not have a career at this much longer. I, I can see this getting to the point where I won't be able to make a living at it or not the living I'm used to. Mm-hmm. And so I made a calculated decision and said, okay, I got to choose something else. I'm going to, I'm going to have a career shift. And what a, what a, uh, you know, I kind of fulfilled a fantasy and what a, what a, what a great, you know, opportunity in life when you can say, okay, I've saved a little bit of money. Let me, let me switch gears and have another chapter. Right. Uh, and I decided on the hotel business, partly because it was like the entertainment business. You know, it was all about design and vibe and, and throwing a party and international travel. And I was like, that's sexy enough for me. I'll do that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that's how I got into it. And I started in Latin America. And then somebody uh, introduced me to some, some folks in Africa. And I came and looked at the opportunity here. And I was like, you know, this Africa is a place where you can make $100 million in five years. You could do that. And I'm, I want to swing for the bleachers. Let's go for it. And that's how I got here. And that's that's how I got from the music business. It's a good question. People always ask me, like, why would you yeah. go from that mm-hmm. to this? But, I, you know, I had a great run at it. And ultimately, for guys, for entrepreneurs, and probably for a lot of your guests, especially in startup, uh, the startup hour, you know, the journey is as fun as the, the result. You know, mm-hmm. where I get to be in Africa and meet guys like you, you know. None of my peers are doing that back in the states. You know, they're they're doing the same old, same old. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that's how I got here. And that's how how do you go from uh, Latin America to visiting Africa and then seeing a hundred million dollar opportunity that I don't see sitting here? <laughs> well, I mean, it's 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 a metaphor, but uh, at the same time, um, when I was in Latin America, so so I knew when I was in the U.S. that that. I knew that the growth was in the developing Mm -hmm. markets because the developing world had not yet gone through the the sort of the industrial age Mm -hmm. uh, and information age uh, growth that that the more mature markets Mm -hmm. went to. And I kind of liken it to being a a pirate or a buccaneer or an explorer, you know, like my, the equivalent of being in the States right now for me is like staying in England back in the 1600s, like the action is out in the world. And I saw the action as being in Latin America or Asia or, or Africa. But I also think that you have to kind of pick your poison. You got to say, this is this is what I'm going to do. This is where I'm going to dig in. And uh, I started in Latin America. I liked the vibe. I liked the girls. I liked the music. I liked the food. I liked the beaches. Uh, but there was, you know, it, it was still pretty developed. It was quite close to the States. And, and so there were a lot of guys like me who, who were kind of looking at the same stuff. When I got to Africa... Um, it was just so much bigger and there was so much more people and there was so much more excitement and it wasn't so influenced by the winds of North, you know, Mm -hmm. of, of of the United States. It was its own thing. And, uh, and the people, uh, here had a, had a a vibrancy and an energy and also the, it it looked like it was just about to explode. And so when I say make a hundred million bucks, it's, it's a, you know, a random number, but I, but, but this is where huge fortunes can be made. And if you look at the, the entrepreneurs around mm-hmm. Lusaka, you know, the, 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 I know that a bunch of, bunch of them you've had on, yeah, yeah, we on, on here. Some are, you know, uh, some are young, some are older. I mean, I was, I was at a real estate conference recently where there was like a 33 year old billionaire from, from Ni- Nigeria. I was like, how dare you? Like, <laughs> what, who do you think you are? <laughs> like pay some dues, you bastard. <laughs> um, yeah, but that's that's it. If you if you if you find your groove and you get the scale right and and you you get a system and and you you know don't get lost in 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 sort of your own myopia, uh, you know, as an outsider. And it always you know, I mean, if you came to to the U.S., you'd probably see things I don't see because right. I've been there too long. Right, and, and that's that's what I meant, uh, uh, CJ. Like, how how do you see you know? Because we maybe we get caught up with our daily whatever, and we fail to see opportunity when it it's right in front of our face. I, w- I want us to take a short break, and then maybe when we come back, we can talk more about growth. I, I know uh, last five minutes you've mentioned growth uh, quite a number of times. Maybe we can touch of how you see the the growth, uh, uh, how you see the, the the real estate market, you know, growing. Sure. On the Startup Hour show this morning, we're talking to uh, Manhattan-born 
uh, Christopher Janu, who began his unlikely career as a record producer during the early 90s. He was signed to uh, MCA Records and enjoyed a series of top 10 singles while producing and remixing for an array of artists, including the likes of CNC Music Factory, D'Angelo, Maxwell, and Madonna. He's also uh, an award-winning producer, author, hotelier, and investor. His group has invested in a range of development sectors, including uh, media, hospitality, fine tech, low-cost housing, and commercial property development throughout Africa today we discuss Zambia's lucrative real estate market now Christopher you sp you speak of growth a lot you see growth yep. potential on the continent and uh, in, in Zambia in particular describe what kind of growth you see on uh, in the real estate uh, market in Zambia five ten years from now mm. well you know certainly investors are always looking for growth right mm. and uh, the the thing about the property market is it's it's there's probably no other sector that touches so many businesses and services and people mm -hmm. that you know there's an expression as goes the property market so goes the economy and if you look in the in the u.s where i'm from you know uh, the u.s wasn't the richest country in the world uh prior to world war ii it happened after world war ii and and the, and the reason it happened was because the property market boomed and uh you know all the G gis came back from the u.s the government backed uh uh, they, they guaranteed mortgages so that, that all these heroes could buy houses and they were all modest houses and there, suddenly everybody had a middle class house all over the country. Well, what happened? So, you know, they have houses so they need cars. So the car industry takes off. Uh, these young families have kids so they need schools and they need stuff for school and they need groceries and they need banks and they need services. And so as the real estate market develops, all the other ancillary things that support a, a, a robust property market happen. So the same thing is happening here. You know, I, when I got here four years ago in Zan uh, to Lusaka, like I said earlier, McKinney and, and uh, you know, New Kasama and lots of other parts of town were considered the country, you know. Uh, and now, you know, those are prime areas and, you know, the, the, the boundaries of the city is growing ever outward. And that's happening. That's that's not a that's not a Lusaka story. That's an Africa story. And part of it is driven by this, you know, this youth bulge and the fact that they're, you know, the population in Africa is going to double by 2050. I think there were about 900 or a billion people now mm -hmm. in, in Africa, uh, 900 million to 1 billion. And they say, uh, I, I document this in the book, um, that there are will likely be somewhere between 1.8 and 2 billion people in Africa by 2050. So think about that. The population is projected to be, of the world, is po projected to be about 8 billion to 9 billion people by 2050. So extrapolate that. What does that mean? That means one in four people will live in Africa by 2050. 25% of the global population will live here. So if I'm... Um, if I'm looking to build shopping malls or, or housing or get into retail or education or any of those things, I mean, it's not just a property story. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, damn, this is the place to be, you know? So uh, given that, there are, you know, you, you have to parse the opportunity and find out where, where you can play and where your entry points are. But that's the growth I'm talking about to answer specifically, Patrick. Amazing. Um, you, you mentioned before you talked of... Um or the we're having issues with traffic people mm. moving back and forth in the city where we don't have enough accommodation is it is is this a problem for the people who see the opportunity is this something we're not doing enough of well sure i mean you know the, the more you uh, unlock areas through you know good roads or infrastructure the more developers like me you know see opportunities and want to want to bring you know uh development but, you know, you just go where, where, where you, you know, eventually it all catches up. And so I, I don't fret about that. I just go to where I see the low-hanging fruit. Well, one thing I want to mention is, you know, this, this is a – I do a lot of teaching. I just came back from Tanzania. Okay. Um, I just like doing it, and, and partly because I like people to make money, and I like the idea of giving out information because you guys being successful is not going to impact whether I'm successful or not. So it feels good to share. And the property market is one of those things that people make such a mystery about. And I, my, my frank opinion is that it's quite simple, and, but it's all about information. And a lot of people don't give it to you. I mean, it took me a long time to understand commercial real estate. And once I got, once I understood it, I was like, 
that's what this is all about? Are you <laughs> kidding me? <laughs> Why did I not do this sooner? So um, I'll do a little plug. You know, my company uh, sponsors the Zambia International Property Expo, mm -hmm. right? And one of the things we, we do is uh, we have on uh, – it's at East Park Mall, May 19th and 20th. And on the 20th, we set up this whole day program of free real estate classes, free investment classes. And they, they cover everything from, like – uh, analyzing deals to your financial education because there's only a handful of ratios in, in real estate that will tell you 90% of the deals whether they're whether they're viable or not we we talk about you know where the opportunities are how, how to start at, at any level we 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 analyze the market and and show you how to recognize whether you're in a, a down cycle or an up cycle or whether it's time to sell or whether it's time to buy because none of this is rocket science it's actually it's it's pretty you know it's pretty uh, simple stuff. Um, obviously, you know, smart people will do better, but I firmly believe that, that you know, the real estate play is something that pr most people should be involved in on some level because it's just so available to everybody. So I encourage people to, you know, avail themselves of the free classes. They can go to the Facebook page mm -hmm. and see what the program is. It's a uh, uh, Zip Expo on mm -hmm. Facebook. Yeah. And, um, like I said, I, I just got back from Tanzania, and I was asked to do a three-day workshop in Dodoma, the new, new capital, where mm -hmm. I taught real estate classes. And, uh, you know, to the extent that any of your listeners were at universities or anything, and they want me to come and give you a free two- or three-hour, you know, real estate workshop, I, I love doing it. And half the time, somebody comes up to me after the class and says, I have this deal I want to talk to you about. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's a, you know, real estate's all about education information but but i will encourage your listeners to you know whether i mean i do other things but the the real estate market is so fundamental and it's so available and and most of the entrepreneurs you you will meet whether they're in hotels or in fintech or in mines or they all have a real estate portfolio because it's it's where most of the money is made mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, i was telling wapi earlier 90 percent of uh, all millionaires in the United States are property millionaires. And that represents more, uh, that the, the, the real estate sector is more represented, is overrepresented. They, they actually, there are more millionaires in the property sector than all other sectors combined, if you can imagine. But it's easy to imagine because if you think about it, your parents have a house, you know, it was a modest house, they raised you guys in it, and suddenly mm -hmm. it's in the middle of Cavalonga, mm -hmm. you know? And now it's a million dollar house. And that's what happened in the United States. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening here. So modest people find themselves on appreciating assets. And, you know, that's why it's, it's you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a very democratic form of wealth creation is what I say. Amazing. You, you, you've actually, uh, you're responsible for some of the retail chains that we, we've seen popping up around. Yes. I want to know, wh where do you see more of the opportunity? Is it in the commercial side or the residential side of real estate? There is opportunity in both, but what what I see right now is that, that um, the residential side has some, some issues to work out, right? Because, uh, you know, you've got a, a somewhat complex uh, a system of, you know, customary laws and federal laws and, and uh, you know, for for you know people that come from a republic like i do it's like it gives me a little brain damage trying to figure that out but um i think the biggest bottleneck really is uh the the financing uh component you know because um, consumer finance is just really hard to come by here so that makes it very difficult now if i had if i was a pension fund and i had baskets of money i th i would do rental houses or rental apartments because i think in a market where there's no mortgage you know mortgages are scarce People have to rent. It happened after the global financial crisis in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So there's there's going to be a robust rental market for a long time. I like commercial quite a bit because I I know that there's a lot of international groups that see what I see. You know, like Builders Warehouse is owned by Walmart. Did you know that? No. Yeah. <laughs> and Game, I believe, is also a, Wal a Walmart a product. Walmart, yeah. yeah. And now, why did a company from Arkansas buy Game and Builders Warehouse? I mean, they got. They got plenty of stuff to do elsewhere, because mm -hmm. they they saw they saw exactly what I saw, which is you know this, this youth bulge, the the population growth, the urbanization, the lack of uh, you know the uh, the underserved uh, uh, quality of the of, of the consumer market, and they were like, okay, I'm, we're we're going where the action is, and that that's Africa, you know, it's other places too, but it's in particular Africa, 
-hmm. So when you have a bunch of international tenants like that who want to be in Africa, they, they rely on, on local guys to make it happen for them. Developers, financiers, brokers, you know, and let's not forget that, it, you know, being in the property game is not just about developing hotels. It could be about, you know, renting out rooms or building student accommodations mm -hmm. or, or, or being a broker, putting together retail uh, groups with, you know, uh, strategic locations where they want to be. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's a, it, there's, there's a lot of entry points in this, in this game, but, um, I'll share with you something I was sharing with Mopway early. Yeah, uh -huh. I, I, uh, occasionally, I, you know, I have a pretty big network in the real estate mm -hmm. sector. And, and so occasionally I'll, I'll, I'll call friends in the, in the, the property sector and you, you know, information is power. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll call one of them's, you know, Anutu, what, what do you, what do you think? What's, what's the opportunity right now? What do you see? You uh -huh. know, where, where, where do you, where do you like in terms of the real estate game right now? And Anutu says to me, well, you know, something people are overlooking is, is the compounds. I was like, the compounds, what? <laughs> she was like, well, CJ, take a look at it. You know, the, these compound, uh, the compounds are crowded. They, they rent out rooms. You can get a room for about 800 kwacha, uh, you know, a month and, mm -hmm. and they're all rented, you know, and, uh, you can buy a three or four bedroom for, you know, 50,000 kwacha, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, that means that, you know, if you have a four bedroom, you're, you're, you're making about 40,000, 35 to 40,000 kwacha a year on a 50,000 kwacha investment. I mean, where can you make that kind of return? I don't make that in hotels. Mm -hmm. I don't make that in commercial real estate. So at any part of the food chain, you can, you can find an entry point. And, you know, a smart Zambian could, could start accumulating compound sites you know, houses and adding a bedroom. And, and as, as property escalates and, and the rents escalate, you, you're, you're creating compounded wealth creation. You know, you, it's, 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 uh, it's just one example. You can do land development, you know, you can do a cemetery. You can, there's, real estate is, is anything that is a real asset that involves, you know, somebody conducting business or, or residing there. And, you know, that's a pretty broad description you know wow uh, uh, uh as a developer uh, how important is uh, urban planning uh, uh to you in, in, that's in terms of uh, you know the city fathers it's 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 super important um because as you know urban planning you know allows for more capacity you know and and more development and it encourages developers right mm -hmm. like i can't i wouldn't do a hotel project or a mall project on a a uh congested road that has no parking access egress that gets people mad because they're stuck in traffic all you know afternoon during the lunch hour so you know government or 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 the authorities that be can can unblock investment by creating you know sort of a, a platform for it you know you know give me a platform do a double carriage roadway and i you know and then we can do something there but like i said earlier you know i don't dwell on that kind of stuff and i don't i don't try and you know, I don't seek out, you know, I don't advocate policy or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I think business finds its own level and, and it's, it's, uh, you know, people like, like myself and investors, we, we, you know, we, we just go where the action is and where, you know, and that's the thing, you know, if, 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 if government doesn't create the platform, the investors should just go where there is one, you know, whether it's Zambia or Uganda or Tanzania or Kenya, you know, they, they're, they're opportunists. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's really important, you know, and governments always tend to, you know, there's always some people who get it and some people who don't. And it's not just Zambia, it's the United States, it's everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. But um, but there's always an opportunity and education is the key, you know, that's that's the main thing. And there's a lot of information out there. So if, if real estate's your game or if you want to have that be a part of your portfolio, then um, it's easy to, you know, get the education online on YouTube. And like I said, we do we do classes as well. If you go to the Property Boot Camp on Facebook, mm -hmm. Property Boot Camp, you'll see we we throw classes all the time, and most of them are for free. Mm -hmm. So uh, avail yourself of information, find a mentor, um, make yourself valuable, uh, gather information that's valuable to others. Know your market, whether it's West Lusaka, Lusaka West, sorry, mm -hmm. or uh, or any other place.
But uh, coming back to the issue of growth, don't you think that uh, in terms of uh, urban planning, don't you think that uh, if, 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 if the right policies were in place, it would help you maybe, you know, develop yeah. quicker, you know, come up with uh, more hotels or more, or more shopping malls and whatnot? For sure. And, and you know, it's policy not just related to uh, infrastructure, but it's also, you know, consistent tax policies or rational right. policies about hiring and firing. Right. You know, that's one thing that we 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 uh, bang our heads against sometimes is is, you know, it's it's um, sometimes it's it's difficult to let go of people because of policy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so that discourages people from hiring or it makes them a little reticent because they don't want to be in a situation where they they, they then have somebody who is, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, trying to besmirch them or, or, or sue them for letting them go when they maybe just didn't do a good job. Um, so it's up and down the board. There's another thing too, and uh, uh, things like uh, transfer taxes or, or any any regulatory environment that is somewhat uh, not stable or, or prone to change discourages investment. Because, you know, investors, especially long lead investors, they, they need to know what it's going to be like in five years. So, uh, and a lot of, you know, we, we find that in a lot of environments that they, they can't count on it because, you know, new people will get into parliament <laughs> and they'll have some bright idea and know it should be this way and they're making too much money or they're not, you know, this or that. You need consistency. Yeah. Amazing. <clears throat> Let's talk uh, about something in particular, sales. Mm. I believe sales is the backbone of like any industry you go into, whether be it in um, real estate, retail so I've, I've, I've heard you close a sale with one phone call cg it takes me like <laughs> back and forth yeah, i was there oh. <laughs> <laughs> i was in the room cj don't forget i was in the room so um i mean what's the sales process like how, how do, you, do you have something that you develop on your own as time goes by or i mean yeah yeah no, i understand the question that's a great question actually so my Look, everything is selling, isn't it? Everything. We're always selling ourselves. We're, I'm trying to sell my kids to close the door and wear their underwear under their pants and not over their pants. Or, you know, <laughs> things like that. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to sell my wife on the fact that I, you know, want, want to buy something or, or something. So everything is sales. But um, I don't actually believe in selling per se. I don't, I don't believe in trying to get somebody to do something that they don't want. I believe in uh, providing value. You know, mm -hmm. giving inf whether it's information or uh, or creating value, like, like you know, for instance, when I'm, I you know, as the chairman of the property expo, I had to you know use my network to to make the thing a success, and I had to kind of get my friends and affiliates and a lot of people I don't know to to support the thing because it's you know it's a it's a it's a it's a thing that's meant to support it's it's a platform for my industry, and if you're if if you know if you're in my position, I take a lot of responsibility for that because they're all my friends and so what can I do to create value for them I can create business linkages I but not just not just in name only I'm like Mwape you need to meet Patrick because he's opening a mall in you know uh, Kaoma and he's looking for so it's all about that I and people I, I believe would, would say that about me I'm trying always to connect people to make money to create value to do something and if you develop a, re a, a reputation for that, people want to be around that, right? So the other thing is that when we sell, we're really kind of just selling ourselves, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Like if you go and buy a car and, and some some geeky guy gets in the car and is trying to sell it to you, you're thinking, I don't want to be that guy, you know? <laughs> but like if you're like Steve McQueen or, or Denzel Washington and, and he's the salesman and he gets in the car, Oh damn! I want to just look <laughs> just like Denzel in that in that new Toyota Hilux, you know. So I I also think that that, that selling has a lot to do with besides providing value, it, 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 they they have to believe in you, and that's that's the name of the game, you know, whether you're in property or anything. Amazing. Um, quick one: How do you analyze a real estate deal? I mean, like you said, people obviously come up to you after a class and say, "You know, CJ, I have this piece of land that would be perfect for a shopping mall." Yeah, yeah. It's fun. well. Okay, so uh, two things. If it, if it's a commercial property, um, I don't over assess it. it it's it's basically uh, 
the location will be chosen by the tenants, right? So they, they know their business. They know where they want to be. And um, they're good at it, right? So I don't have to second guess that too much, you know. Uh, but at the same time, you have to make sure the numbers are right. And so, as I mentioned earlier, I, I have a, you know, there's there's probably about a half a dozen calculations you can do. Mm -hmm. Really simple ones. I mean, I'm not talking about, you know, uh, advanced physics or anything. I'm talking about, like, you know, just some basic geometry that will kind of give you, it will probably, it, it will vet 70 to 80 percent of the deals. And then you can know if you're going to take it further. Because nobody wants to waste time, right? So there are, there are things like, you know, we'll, What's the yield on cost? What's my return on investment? What's the you know, uh, what's the IRR? You know what what you know when do I get the money back? How much could I sell it for based on the capitalization rates or the mm -hmm. yields mm -hmm. that are that are uh, in the market? So it's a combination of looking at the deal specifically and then kind of looking at the macro conditions and saying, hmm, okay, this at least on the surface this looks like it's worth putting more effort into. Mm -hmm. The best part though is that. It also tells you when it's not worth putting more effort into. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you can vet deals before you have to take a flight or get in the car for three hours, it's, that, you know, if it just doesn't make financial sense, it doesn't make financial sense. Um, so those are, all, those are all things we cover. You know, Property Boot Camp, you can, you can find out about all that. Because we go into examples like, you know, is this deal better than that, that deal? Why is it better than that deal? Is, is this deal... Uh, worth buying at that price or is, are they asking too much or or as i said the the thing about real estate is because it's in, in an inefficient market mm -hmm. you can find great deals because of people's mitigating cir circumstances right like you know patrick you're getting married you're flying off to england and you need to leave in two months you don't have time to get the best price mm -hmm. to a buyer like Mwape, that's like oh okay i can realize a 20 percent profit as soon as i buy this thing because Patrick doesn't have time to wait to get the right price, right? And that's the beauty of real estate. Uh, now, you compare that to the stock market. You want to buy $100 at Apple stock, do you think you're going to get it for 20% less than it's worth? Nope. No. You know, And when you buy $100 worth of Apple stock, do you think next week it, it could be 20% more than, than, than you bought it for? Probably not. I mean, you know, the stock yeah. market goes up and down, but not like that. But let's say Patrick's got a, you know, his 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 bride is waiting for him in London, and he's he's out of here. So I can buy it for twenty percent less, perhaps, because you're in a hurry, you know. And if you're if you don't give me a good deal on it, I can just move on to the next guy and wait for a new deal because I don't have to buy every deal, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then I realize, you know, you didn't take very good care of your place. I can paint it and put an extra bedroom on it, and now it's worth twenty percent more. Property is the only category I can think of where you can make such, you can buy inefficiently, you can buy and create your profit when you buy, because you know it's worth more, and then you can add profit after that, because I see something that Patrick didn't see, you know I know what the market wants, like nobody wants a pink house right? or whatever, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? But but how, how does one determine uh, the price? How do you know that this, this is the right price? Or how do you add value to determine the right price? From, let's say from mm. talking houses you know, if you're talking to houses, it's a it, it it's kind of easy to to know what the comparables are and what things are moving at. You know, the the, the market moves at the right price, and so you can kind of see where people are buying and trading at. Mm -hmm. So that's an indicator. But um, I'll give you an example. I I I uh, I, might, I I I looked at a house. Somebody wanted me to buy a house recently. And they wanted a lot of money for it. They wanted like a four million kwacha for it. It was a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought to myself, well, okay, so if I buy this house, what could I rent it for? And I, and I know the rent is only about 20,000 kwacha. So to me, that, that, that would be 20,000 kwacha times 12 is 24,000 kwacha against, you know, 400,000. That's like a f maybe a 5% return, I think, mm -hmm. if my math is right. 5% return ain't going to work for me. I want a 15% return in, in, in a booming housing market. So that was easy. I'm just like, no, too much, you know, and I determined that right away. But that's the kind of thing, if if you can, you know, figure out your return on invested capital and 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 you know what your your requirements are. Let's look, Patrick. You you, you work hard for your money, and you know if inflation's at six or seven or eight percent, you got to make that at least, right? 
So you know you got to that's your baseline to keep your your money kind of you know at a flat line. But you know it's a it's a booming market, and if you're smart, you can get 12, 13 percent. That's what the pension funds look for, right?、Mm-hmm. So let's say you just knew that, like I want to make 12 percent on my money. So what's that mean on that four hundred thousand or four million quacha house?、Mm-hmm. That means I've got to make four fifty thousand quacha a year. I'm、uh, sorry, a month.、Uh, mm. Sorry, what am I? Five hundred. A year. <laughs> I've lost my. Yeah, I've lost my math. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I, I, whatever twelve twelve thousand,、uh, whatever twelve percent of of four hundred thousand or four million quacha is,、mm-hmm. what is twelve percent of four million? It's five hundred thousand. Five hundred thousand. Five hundred thousand quacha a year. So I, I need to make five hundred thousand quacha a year in rent to buy that four hundred or four million quacha、uh, house. So that's pretty simple. I don't have to overthink it, you know. And and if you know your hurdle is twelve percent, you know exactly what you're looking for. You know you don't have to waste time. You know brokers call you up. You don't have to go see houses and check the paint and you know check the borehole and everything. You just say,、oh, well, what's it renting for? What can it rent for?、Mm-hmm. How much do they want? Sorry, that's it. So wouldn't wouldn't it be good in in all aspects to at least be able to to vet eighty percent of the deals just without run? You, you know if you know what you want, you know what your hurdles are, you know how to calculate certain things. You know how to assess value. That's, that's a big thing in the property game.、Mm-hmm. You got to know what something's worth, what it's worth paying for, what what it's worth, you know, to you, what value you can create out of it. That's 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 kind of the name of the game right there. Is just knowing what something's worth. I want us to take a short break again.、Uh, when we come back, maybe we could talk more about,、uh, as a developer, that is about student accommodation. You, you mentioned that、sure. earlier. Maybe we can see whether there's opportunity in uh, creating uh, accommodation for students. Obviously, there's some listeners that are intent on knowing your <laughs> views on that. Our youthful listeners. All right. Three、we'll、secrets about student housing coming up. <laughs> <laughs> the Startup Hour, giving entrepreneurs education. Motivation and inspiration from successful entrepreneurs from all corners of the country. The Startup Hour show we discuss、uh, Zambia's lucrative real estate market with serial entrepreneur Christopher Janu, who's managing director of Janu Africa and chairman of the Janu Group. Now, Christopher, before the break, we were talking about、uh, student accommodation. As a developer,、mm. is there potential in student accommodation or student housing? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. The, the way the way I look at student housing is,、mm-hmm. it's it's just another real estate product, right?、Mm-hmm. But it has a couple of special features. For instance, it's it's temporary. You know, these kids are going to be there for one, two, three, maybe four years max.、Mm-hmm. Um, they need to save money, right? And、um, they're not going to buy the thing, right? So I can develop a product that would be hard to sell, but but is very efficient to rent, right? You know this market is very fickle. If you if they if you don't if you build something with with、um, some rapid build、uh, rapid build system, you, it, they're hard to buy because Zambians are resistant to that. They want brick and mortar, but not so with student housing. Plus, these kids will live four to a room, six to a room,、uh, so I can put the bathrooms and the the the, the wet the wet works on either side and create sort of like a more of a a dorm environment without kitchens and stuff. So it's a lot cheaper. To build,、um, we know there's growth in education, right? We、mm-hmm. know that、uh, universities like Unilas and Unza、uh, and CBU、uh, are leaving money on the table because they can't accommodate enough students.、Mm-hmm. From what I hear, there, there, you know, the places, the the、uh, housing market right around the universities is generally just jammed with students and, and kids from Botswana and Zimbabwe who would otherwise come here can't find places to live. So to me, that's the, those are all the markings of a great opportunity, you know.、Uh, so yeah, I I think there's a lot of opportunity. Is, is there is there opportunity for you as a developer to to maybe partner with、uh, the powers that be, maybe to develop、uh, some of the public institutions in terms of、uh, the, the the housing shortage that, that is there? For housing or for student housing? For for student housing. For student housing. Yeah. yeah. So do do you see opportunities where you can step in, maybe say,、uh, step up to Unza and say, look, I will build.、Uh, You know the the necessary dorms that you need, and you know I'll run them for X amount of years and and whatnot. Yeah, I do see the opportunities now. I've 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 gone after a couple of projects like that、mm-hmm. with with CBU and with、uh, Unilus,、mm-hmm. um, and most recently with Cavendish. Now the 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 thing about student accommodations is they're easy to build. You can build them really fast. There's a need for them, right? 
But ultimately, as a developer, I, I need the university to, you know, guarantee the the offtake, as we call it. You know, if I build it, you got to guarantee that you're going to put your students there, right? Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. the bank's going to want me to pay back the money. Mm -hmm. They're 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 very rude like that. They like their money back, right? <laughs> so, so as a as a developer, you're you're always mitigating your risk, right? So if if I'm getting a supermarket into a retail center, I want them to sign a 10-year lease or at least commit to a rolling lease. Same with student accommodations. If, if I'm going to build uh, student accommodations, let's say around UNDP where Cavendish is close by and Unilus is close by, then I, I would probably go to Unilus and Cavendish and just say, okay, guys, I, you know, you don't have to guarantee all of it, but I need to know that you're going to fill 50 beds or 100 beds, uh, and then I'll build it. And you have to commit to three or four years, so I'm sure I can pay the bank back. Because the worst thing that could happen is you build the thing, and um, for some reason, you know, the university decides to build its own. And then you're kind of, you know, they might say, you know, this is a good business. Why should I give it to CJ? You know, and then you're, you're kind of left hanging there, right? So those are the, that's, that's the only caveat I would provide. There's, there's one other one too, which is that, you know, in, in, a, in a situation where you're, you're housing students, um, you have very little leverage in collecting the rent. You know, you have to get the university to help you do that by saying, I'll withhold the degree until you make it good on your on your bills, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If the university doesn't do that, then what leverage do we really have, you know, to, to make sure that everybody pays their rent on time? Um, and, you know, not, you know it, it is a business, and, and ultimately it's, you just have to make sure that you're, you're covering your lenders because you, you have a deal go bad, and then you have reputational risk and, you know, all that, which we don't want. So... Uh, I have approached the universities. They they sometimes don't understand the business sort mm -hmm. of concerns that that developers have. Mm -hmm. But if they if they address them, you could build you know student accommodations all day long. Mm -hmm. You know, if you do it on a smaller scale, though. Having said that, let's say let's say you have a little property and you can build a couple of small, you know, bed and breakfast kind of situations for students and stuff. That I think is, you know, a low risk business. Okay. Oh. I guess my question was more: Would would you do it on a what you call it on a BOT kind of a, kind of a, a arrangement where you build, operate, and then transfer back to the university after you've recovered your money? Because uh, you're a developer at the end of the day, yeah, yeah. So, you know. It it depends on the situation. If if they are giving me their land, then they'll probably want it to be a BOT. Uh huh. But they they may also come to you and say, "Look, Patrick, you go out and find the land, buy it, and we'll guarantee you your occupancy because we we have no land to give you." Uh -huh. So it can go both ways. Amazing. Um, interestingly enough, when people think of uh, real estate, construction, what comes to mind is manual labor, mm. you know. But now with the introduction of different types of technologies, you know, people are using drones on site to, to, to just survey everything that's happening. So what are some of the other technologies that are in play right now? Mm. <laughs> That's a good question. Actually, it's funny you should say that because we, you know, at the at the property expo on the nineteenth and twentieth. So, the, if you don't mind, I'll just tell you. The, the, so, it's it's the the property expo is, uh, you know, under the big tents, and it's all the, the the service providers and the developers, and you'll see all this real estate product and people who have systems and anybody who has kind of a touch point to the property market is going to be there. What we've done adjacent to it is we said, right, uh, we'll have two programs. The first day is a program called prop tech which is property technology and innovation and basically as i was describing the music business and the publishing business and all these other businesses that have, have been disrupted through uh, uh technology and and you know basically exponential chip uh, capacity meaning big data and all that stuff it's come to the property market and it's come in the form of dashboard cloud and uh, app-based uh platforms that you know you can, you've got uh, dashboard and app-based platforms that will let you, you know, redecorate your room before you actually redecorate. You can kind of check it out. You can, you know, you can sell a product in, in London just as easily as you could sell it in Cavalonga. Mm -hmm. you, uh, you can take virtual reality tours. Now they have these facility management programs where you can do uh, basically remote facility management uh, through through dashboard based systems you know my hotel uses customer relationship management systems and uh, uh, pension funds use risk management systems 
somebody, t you know, I didn't fully understand the whole risk management thing. And there was a company coming up from South Africa to make this presentation. And I was like, you know, Grant, explain. Like, I don't understand risk management. What are you, what are you preventing uh, 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 against? And he said, well, just imagine, you know, you leave a ladder or a piece of scaffolding outside your hotel mm -hmm. for two days. And big data through these risk management platforms can tell you that the chances of a seven-year-old kid kicking a ball into the ladder and knocking it over and breaking a window and and perhaps, you know, breaking his bones somehow, is 0.024%. Now, that's the, 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 they call it the liquidity of data. You can take these giant data sets and you can, you can identify risks that you otherwise wouldn't know about. Now, this may not be that important to you if you're a, a homeowner, but if you're a mine or a construction company or, uh, you know, a nuclear power plant or mm -hmm. a dam, that's like huge. You you can identify through these risk management platforms where the risks are. Oh my goodness, there's a crack in the dam. It's two centimeters long. The data sets tell us that the risk of that expanding to a breach is X Y Z, and you can address it. Particularly for the like the cement companies and the big manufacturing groups. That's that's huge. So that's what that's how technology kind of fits into it. On a sexier level, you can talk about, you know paint that is sensitive to the to the number of people in the room and, or and can tell you if the temperature is right right or smart systems that that adjust the the the, the tint of your windows or uh, detect an intruder or tell you your 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 child is in the bathtub and you know is at risk or something so uh it's you know it, it it's just the beginning but i think you know our our homes are going to become smart homes like our cars have become smart cars right. our cars tell us where to go they tell us when to stop they tell us we're about to run over something that's what homes are going to be about. On, on the same topic, before before I lose my train of thought, since since we're you know we're more or less in an infancy stage, if I dare call it that, in terms of the, the real estate sector, do you think it'll be wise for us to kind of like do a quantum leap into smart technologies uh, and have uh, smart cities across Zambia, as mm -hmm. opposed to like you know building, you know f uh, you know using the yeah. brick and mortar kind of phase and maybe just completely switch to to smart technologies? Oh man, I do. I think it's a great opportunity. You know, it's funny. Elon Musk uh, made a business out of SpaceX because mm. he, he, he looked at the space industry and said, you know what, we have all these new materials, we have all these new propellants, we have all this, 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 this new technology, and we're still sending people into space on technology that's 60 years old, right? So he reinvented the whole thing, and the property market is exactly the same. The beauty of Africa is that Africa is, is what they, cons they call this a breakout area, meaning you know, you're going straight from the agrarian age to the information age. You know, this is the, the, the uptake of smartphone technology in Africa is arguably the fastest uptake of a technology in human history. And they measure that from introduction to mainstream use, just by, by sheer numbers. And so, to your point, you know, there are so many uh, technologies, you know, and, 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 and trends that are happening. For, for instance, in, in, in the mature real estate markets, we have this whole thing about the sharing economy. You know, we, we you know we, we like to work in sharing environments like the Works or Regis or you know those are huge concepts in the mature markets. Mm -hmm. um, we're downsizing our spaces. We we like proximity. We like more efficient spaces. Um, all that is 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 uh, about the 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 new economy and smart products. But then specifically with building materials and stuff and roads and infrastructure, it's the same. There's there there are ways where you know africa can 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 sort of leap forward if it embraces uh technology and it's only going to get more more and more available and, and cheaper it's just like computers remember yeah. you, you're probably too young to to, mm -hmm. to remember but back in when when the first apple came out it was like 1990 uh, i guess mm -hmm. it was the first time i bought one mm -hmm. Man, it was massively expensive. I didn't know what to do with it. I just, I put it on my desk to impress girls. And now, <laughs> you know, a, a computer will go, has, a, a mainframe has gone from hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to the point where you can buy one for $40, right? Mm -hmm. That's what's happening with, with every, that's, that's the, the, the story of the new economy. More abundance, less cost. And that's definitely applying to building technologies. Mm -hmm. So, do do you think we should? Uh, and, and this is just as a side note: do, should we embrace uh, technologies, infrastructure technologies like uh, toll gates, 
because there seems to be a little bit of resistance there yep. with, the, with the toll gates that are coming up and you know people having to fork out. I don't know. That's a technology. I think that's a that's just a, <laughs> a nuisance. <laughs> Hey, look, it's it's a it's a methodology. Yeah, okay, it's a it's, it's a new methodology. It's a it's a it's a it's a way to finance things. Okay, you know, um, you know that's not for me to say, but there's lots of ways to finance things. If, uh -huh. if they want to do it through tolls, okay, um, maybe more efficient taxations or more efficient, you know, corporate taxes mm. or or maybe you know, I don't know. There are stakeholders that care about the roads and maybe it's the municipalities and and they should pitch in, but. I don't know, man. Nobody likes tolls. Not, not <laughs> in my country either. <laughs> As we wrap up, uh, before I let Mopé come in, uh, just my final question on this. Uh, on the hotel side of it, what, what opportunities do you, do you see in the, in the hotel uh, industry in Zambia? Because obviously you've mm. set up you've set up a hotel in Dola uh, Urban, I believe, mm. Urban. Urban Hotel. Yeah. What, what opportunities? What what drove you into the the, host, the the hospitality business? Is it the the vibrancy of the youth? Or, or, or what is it? Is it the mining sector that kind of kind of uh, is intertwined with the hotel business? What drove you to and 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 in the hotel business in particular? Well, the hotel business is is you know on a personal level it's it's a it's a neat business it's a sexy business it's a it's a social business uh -huh. and it's 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 you know if you like design and you like people and and you like branding and stuff that's that's a lot of fun I, I happen to like that stuff. Um, on a, uh, in terms of Indola, you know, we, we look for places where we find what we call demand generators, right? Uh, I mentioned earlier, we don't really do, people will punt stuff to us in South Luangwa or, or Lower Zambezi. That's too risky for us. We like stuff where, you know, business people fly in, there's an airport, Dangote, Lafarge, KCM, Concola, you know, they're all there, right? And they need to do stuff. There's infrastructure, there's business people, there's UNDP, all that stuff. So we like um, we like places where there are obvious demand generators uh, and where we know we can win on price, and that's how we got to Indola because Indola's got a lot a lot of stuff going on. We've got one in Rhodes Park coming up as well. Um, but the opportunities per se for for Zambians are you know if you're not a developer or you know the the service industry is a huge huge opportunity because as I said with with the other real estate products. You know, we came into Zambia and, and, and southern and eastern Africa, and we said, right, um, okay, well, there are a lot of four and five stars, you know, so let's not do that. Let's go where nobody else is playing, you know. And southern, uh, sorry, Stay Easy is an example of a just a booming, successful, you know, you know, 1,300 kwacha a night, you know, international standards, you know, no frills, but, you know, reliable, professional. That's the space we like to play in. If you're if you're not a developer and you want to get in the service industry and learn it from top to bottom, I think it's 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 a booming area and it's also a, a sort of a regional play. So, um, the it, you know I, I think the fundamentals for hospitality are are really good, but especially at that value end. You know. Awesome. Uh, final question: Is there a correlation between commercial real estate and the commodity prices in Zambia? Well, of course, it's a trick question, isn't it? <laughs> you, you want to see if I read the paper, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, we have noticed certainly that you know, as as the copper prices, you know, this is. Let's be honest. You mm -hmm. know, this Zambia is over reliant on minerals, oh. right? Mm -hmm. And so you're you're sort of the dog that gets wagged by the tail a little bit, if you know what I mean. Um, and it seems like the lessons been learned is as you know, all hard lessons get get learned eventually mm -hmm. and the, the economy has a lot more going on than just minerals right now it's there which is why developing the property market is so expensive but there, there is no doubt that when you know we feel in any business the gyrations of, of cash supply and cash supply is very much determined by the mineral sector and so sure enough you know just like you know in the United States when when the market the housing market collapsed everything collapsed when when you in Zambia or any other commodity-rich country like Angola or Nigeria, you know, if if there's a, a hiccup in 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 your main uh, cash uh, cow, you know, man, there's going to be some bumps and bruises. You know, mm. we're all going to get our, our our knees a little knocked. But um, but I'm really, I'll, I'll, I will say this on an optimistic note about about uh, the economy. Being in Indola, I didn't, you know, when, when you sit in one place and you get to see the ebb and flow of the people coming in and out, you, you learn stuff. Mm -hmm. What I learned is I had no idea so many people came down from Lumabashi. 
right? And I had no idea that there was so much infrastructure stuff going on, like water reticulation mm -hmm. and expansions to, you know, whether it's Sab Miller or or uh, Dangote or and you know l new lime plants and stuff. And so it's if you're in a hotel lobby, it's 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 almost like standing in the in sort of the wind and everything just kind of blows by you and you get information. Mm -hmm. I also get it through the American Chamber, so we we, we see a lot of a lot of ag and insurance and you know consumer services coming through so um there's a lot more activity below the surface than than, than meets the eye so I, I i would argue with anybody who said we were a, a one-trick economy okay christopher in, in conclusion you you mentioned uh, i think at the beginning of the show that uh you know uh, real estate is a democratic business yeah uh, what kind of wind would you blow to would-be developers that are listening right now or, or, or some of the folks that are involved in real estate uh, in zambia what would be your, your word of advice or your or your your blowing words of conclusion? Uh, yeah, my, <laughs> my, my, my blow some kisses in the, in the direction go. of the, 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 the property industry. Uh, you know, for the for the for the new guys, you know, figure out where you can play, what your strengths are. You know, you may have access to some family land. You may, you know, be a good networker. You may uh, uh, be somebody that people like. You may be a good salesperson and uh, you know, figure out where in the market you can add value, whether it's at the bottom or the middle or the top, and, and be realistic about it, because you can always climb up. I mean, there's a lot of money to be made at the bottom of the market. Uh, for the professionals, I would say, you know, share your knowledge with the kids, man. There's plenty for everybody. And, uh, you know, I'm uh, very keen to give away all my deepest secrets <laughs> about the property market. I'm an open book. So, um, like I say, I encourage you to come to the Property Boot Camp uh, Facebook page, S find some free classes, come to the Zip Expo 2017. When is Facebook that taking page. place? That's May 19th and 20th uh, at East Park Mall. There's on the 20th, on, on that Saturday, there's a day-long series of free real estate classes for all you guys. And um, I'm, I'm going to uh, assure that there's a lot of experts who just spill their guts on all all the stuff that you thought was a big mystery and 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 uh and just keep learning and, and keep asking questions find a mentor and you know feel free to reach out to me through facebook i'm i'm, I'm really excited about the youth in, in zambia and i think there's there's plenty of room for all of us to play so let's get busy and make some money Makes awesome. money. Today on the Startup Hour show, we were discussing Zambia's lucrative real estate market with serial entrepreneur Christopher Janou, managing director of Janou Afrique and chairman of Janou Group. Christopher Janou is an award-winning producer, author, hotelier, and investor. Uh, his uh, group has invested in uh, in a large range, in a range rather, of development sector, including media, hospitality, fine tech, low-cost housing, and commercial property development throughout uh, Africa. As we always say in conclusion on the Startup Hour, thank you, Christopher, by the way, for joining us this morning. Thanks, guys. Really nice to, to be with you all. Thank you. Yeah. It's been an informative uh, and insightful session all rolled into one. Be sure to catch us next week, same time, same day, as we bring you more influential business and thought leaders. Be inspired. And remember, the only person responsible for Zambia's development is you. So what are you doing about it? This has been Startup Hour. Bringing successful Zambian entrepreneurs, policymakers, and subject experts to share their stories. Startup Hour in association with Power FM.